Before we get into the, uh, the lesson this morning, a couple of announcements. One, there's a pair of glasses that were found in, the, in one of those pews in that area there where the Ontiveruses are sitting. No, 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 no. Um, the third from the back pew-ish area. So if, you're, if you can't see, I know why. So here's your glasses. I'm going to put them on the front pew if I put them up on the pulpit, then it's just going to distract me the whole time, and we don't want that. The more distracted I get, the longer I preach, so everybody's going to sit super still, nobody move, nobody blink. Um, the second thing is if you are planning on uh, participating in our trunk or treat, um, don't come tonight, because we're not having it tonight. It's going to be next, uh, next weekend. Next Saturday night from 5 to 7, we're going to do our trunk or treat. Uh, we, uh, the, the weather tonight is going to be, uh, going to be frightful. Um, and, you know, we didn't want, uh, p- you know, pumpkins blowing away and, you know, all kinds of manner of, of uh, uh, tragedies like that. So due to inclement weather, postponing trunk or treat, it'll be next Saturday night. Uh, you've got one more week to get your costumes all ready or your, your car decorations or your candy or whatever it is. And we're going to have a great outreach opportunity. We're inviting all of the community and, and we'll be here giving out candy and, and meeting people from, uh, from the community. And it's going to be uh, you know, a great opportunity. Um, so as we are talking about becoming a Christ-centered church, and I know we've been on this uh, uh, you, you know, this, in this sermon series under this umbrella of becoming a Christ-centered church uh, for, a, for a little while now. And, oh, turn that on every week. I got to remember to turn that on. Uh, and, okay. And so last week, we, last week we talked about the discipleship dilemma. And, and the big thing about that is that we have to understand that our relationship with God is not just about us. Our relationship with God is, is part of this, this uh, ministry of reconciliation when God reconciles us to Him. And make no mistake about it, God is doing the reconciling. God reconciles us to Him, we, and, and the transformation process begins, and then we are given this ministry of reconciliation. And so we are called to be, uh, to be disciples who are discipling. And, and a lot of times we get that backwards where we just think that, that our relationship with God is all about us. And it's just, you know, once we're saved, our job is done and our work is over. And all we do is just skate along, you know, cashing in all of the blessings that come along with being a child of God. And the reality is, is that nothing could be further from the truth. We are called by God, we are reconciled by God uh, to, to be His ambassadors, to be the aroma that, that fills this earth with, with, his, uh, with his righteousness, bringing for the purpose of bringing others to Him. Remember last week we read in, uh, uh, in 1 Peter where it says that God's desire is for everyone. To come to repentance, to a knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. For everyone. Not just the people that look like us. Not just the people that work like us. Not just the people that live next to us. Not just the people that we agree with or or any of that. But everyone. Everyone is who God is after. And if we are His children. If we are a Christ-centered church. Just like Jesus, we will be concerned with, with everyone. And so this morning, I want to ask the question, is there urgency in our discipleship? Is there an urgency about us uh, when it comes to, uh, 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 to this sort of thing? When, uh, uh, when I was in Tennessee preaching, uh, for, uh, there was a, uh, one of the elders there, uh, his name was Bill Perry, and just a sweet godly man and he was in charge of our uh, of the benevolence uh program that we had so so he had kept office hours and and you know a couple times a week and he was uh you know he was retired and older and and uh you know and so you know he just had this uh, you know this joy and this peace and and just a sweetness about him and I always told him I said I want to be you when I grow up Bill and uh and he thought that was funny but 
he was in charge of benevolence. So when people would come in needing money or needing something from the church, they would go see Mr. Bill. And Bill had a, and, and it was always an emergency. It was always an, I mean, people would come in and, and if you want to, if, if you don't think that people need financial support or whatever, just come spend a week in the office and you'll see. But the, so people come in and, and they got to have $48 right now to get my lights turned on. Or man, can you help me with, you know, I need, you know, uh, can you give me some gas because I got to go over here and get a, uh, you know, get a doctor's appointment done or whatever. So, so people come in all the time and for whatever reason, for whatever circumstance, they need some, they need some money, they need some help, some support right now. And Bill had this sign in his office. And, and, it's, and I love the sign. And this, just remember, this is the sweetest guy you ever want to meet. I mean, he is the most loving, the most compassionate, the most, I mean, he was wonderful, a great guy. But he had this sign in his office that he would point to when people would start to get irritated with him because maybe he didn't have this or we didn't have it in the budget or we couldn't do what they were asking him to do. And the sign said, poor planning on your part does not create or constitute an emergency on my part. So just think about that for a second. So he always had to pump the brakes with people because, you know, we just, we, I got to have this right now. I got to do this right. And, and, you know, that's not the way things work all the time. Sometimes it can, but for the most part, there are hoops to jump through. There's protocols and policies and procedures and all that kind of stuff that you have to go through. You know, the church just doesn't keep a big giant wad of cash where anybody that comes in, we're like, oh, okay, you know, $58, you know. There's typically some approvals that have to go and above all that kind of stuff, right? But Bill would always say, if poor planning on your part does not constitute or, or create an emergency or particular urgency on my part. So just, let's just relax. The problem is, is that that spilled, that mentality, and, and Bill and I talked about this a lot because he said that, you know, this, you know, the benevolent, the minister of benevolence is the only person that can, that can say that in the church, Right? Because the problem is that, that that mentality spills over into everything else in our Christian walk sometimes. And we see people who are struggling with, in life, who are, uh, you know, who are beaten and, and broken by sin, who are overwhelmed by, by circumstances of their own creation, or, or maybe they're just lost and they don't know it. And, and we're so comfortable in the lives that we have carved out for ourselves that we think that poor planning on your part doesn't create a, a, an emergency or a particular urgency on my part. And the Bible tells us, we have to have an urgency about us when it comes to, uh, to sharing the gospel, to, to living our faith, to proclaiming uh, the goodness of God and, and, and taking Him up on the offer of the ministry of reconciliation. So the question I want to ask this morning is, is there an urgent determination in our relationship with God? Is there a, uh, are we determined to be disciples? Is there an urgency when it comes to our discipleship, when it comes to our growth, when it comes to, to what it is that, that we are called to do? And is there a, an urgent determination to be disciplers? And yes, disciplers is not a word. Okay, there's the little red squiggly line underneath it back there on, uh, on Heidi's screen. But, but you understand what I'm saying. Is there, are we determined to be disciples? And are we determined to be disciplers? So this morning, as we look at the, uh, this passage in Jude, and this is going to be the kind of the springboard for us to, to go back in time and look at an Old Testament character that lived this very reality right here. Because I think that it's important for us not only to, to read passages and think, like, uh, like Bernie said, we, we got to live this. I mean, it isn't good enough for us just to read and think, oh man, that's very well written. You know, that, that really gets you in the feels, doesn't it? it? It's not good enough for us to read, but, but to live it, and for us to live it, we have to look at, at what it looked like to live this verse before it was ever written down. And we're going to look at that character, or that, that guy here in a minute. But the, there's a couple of realities that I want to talk about briefly first. 
This passage in Jude is, is one, of, one of my favorites. It's one that I, that I go back to a lot and I think about and meditate on and pray over in my own, uh, in my own personal development because I, I too struggle in this area. I too struggle in the area of, of, of doing all of the things that, that are, that are job-like when it comes to being a preacher. And sometimes I fall down on this, this very thing. Uh, and, and so he's, this, this passage really starts for, for me in, well, it, it starts way up, up, up higher, the, the idea where he's talking about being, uh, you know, being leery of, of taking on spiritual warfare that we're just really not, uh, uh, really not qualified. But anyway, in 14, he says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, and any good uh, scholar, uh, you know, Old Testament scholar would know the seventh from Adam is speaking of the genealogy of, of Jesus. Now, I just say that, this whole scholarly thing, just because I know the genealogy of Jesus from Adam because my mother made us memorize that when I was a kid. And, and so it, it's come really in handy, never. But, um, but if you, th- you know, you got Adam and then you got Seth and then you got Enosh and then you got Kaina and then Mahaliel and then Jared and then Enoch, who was Methuselah's dad. All right. Okay. So that's who we're talking about, Enoch. And, there, and Enoch wrote a, uh, had a lot of writings and Jude, you know, he's, he's quoting these right now. He, you know, his writings weren't canonized into scripture, but, um, but, but they're good writings nonetheless. And he said, the, the, the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with his thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and convict all the ungodly of the ungodly acts they've done in the ungodly way and of all the, the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You think these people are ungodly? I mean, I think, I think he's trying to tell us something there. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said, you, in the last times, there'll be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are men who divide you and follow mere natural instincts and do not have have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in the most holy faith. And pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep, your, keep yourselves in God's love. He says, be careful. Make sure that you stay uh, you know, protected and, and redeemed and, and, and sanctified in, in, in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. Then he talks about the product of being discipled and being disciplers. He says, be merciful to those who doubt and snatch others from the fire and save them. You see, one thing that Jude was trying to get across to the, the first century church and to us today is that, that all of the, you know, there's no time to spare. There's no time to wait. There, there's no time to, to, to get it all together and, and then go out in, in this, uh, you know, th- this big campaign of a thing. He's saying you have to have some urgency about you because it, it, there, there's, no, th- we ha- there's no time like the present. That's the whole idea of using the term snatch others from the fire. D- just think about that. Snatch them from the fire i can't think of anything that gets people moving quicker than fire J- just have one break out right next to you i mean you get you just jump out i mean there is an urgency when when fire is involved because it doesn't take any time at all i think i pulled something right there that kind of hurt i got some i need to stretch before i preach next time because it, it, you know, the thing about it is that fire will hurt you immediately. Immediately. So this idea of, of, uh, of, of urgency is what he's trying to get across. And, and so what I, what I want to do is, is put that terminology, I want to uh, kind of take urgency and cram it into this idea of determination. There is this determined urgency. Because if you're going to to snatch anybody away from the fire, you got to get close to that fire yourself. 
And you've got to be determined to do that. I don't know if you've ever had a house catch on fire or anything. You know, maybe something, you're at a campfire and something gets in, gets close to it, you know, whatever. You gotta, and and you've got to get that away from it. You've got to really, really want whatever it is that's in that or close to that fire to go near it to get it. There is an inherent determination involved in this. See, in order to snatch others from the fire, we have to get close to the heat. And we have to be determined to get this done. What is it? What is it in your life that, you know, we all ask this question, you know, what, you know if you've ever had a fire, what would, you, you know, what would you go in your house to rescue from a fire? I mean, obviously your children, your, you know, your wife, your husband maybe, you know. Obviously the living, but, but is, there, is there an inanimate object? You know, I have a Bible that my mother uh, gave me, uh, you know, just a couple of years before she died. It used to be my preaching Bible, and then it started falling apart, and I had to get it rebound, and it started falling apart again. So, so now, because, you know, it's a sacred thing now, Grant. Uh, and so now I, hold, I, you know, I, I keep this thing. I don't preach out of it anymore. I don't let anybody touch it or look at it or breathe on it or get close to it. And if there was a fire, I'd be, I'd be determined to save this Bible what is it that you're determined that you would risk life and limb that you would risk the 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 injury of this heat to save now right now we're all thinking of some maybe it was you know grandma's china or or a quilt that was made an irreplaceable whatever is there is there any person that that you know right now family friend classmate uh you know colleague at work customer student is there any person that you know of right now that's lost and dying outside of christ that maybe maybe you don't know for a fact maybe you just maybe you don't know what their relationship with god is like Let me ask you this, what in your life is more important than finding out that very fact and then doing something about it? What what is? Is there a determination in being discipled? You know, determination in in, in being discipled is in being disciples. Because you see, we can call ourselves Christians. You can't call yourself a disciple because that's an action word. You got to be being discipled. You know, there's activity involved in that. And that and that has everything to do with our spiritual formation. And so the question quickly becomes, is there determination in our spiritual formation? Are we determined to be spiritually formed, to be transformed by God? And this takes effort. This takes planning. It takes, uh, you know, it takes being intentional. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, we see Jesus. See, if we want to be Christ-like, we have to be intentional. Mark 1 and 35 is one of my, uh, another one of my favorite verses. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. You see, the, the spiritual formation of Jesus, the dependence on, on the Father by, by Jesus Christ, it, that was so important to him that it was a, a, a daily thing for, he, for him to get up. It says, you know, very early in the morning, it was what he did in the morning. That's what he did. Jesus understood that that what we do at the very beginning of our day is going to set the tone for the rest of it. And there was no time to wait when it came to spiritual formation. The mentality that that our Lord and Savior had while He was fully human and fully God living the, the life of redemption for us, the mentality He had was, you know, I can't wait till after lunch to get this day started in a spiritual direction. I, I can't wait for, uh, you know, for after coffee or, or, or breakfast or whatever. It, it was the very first thing that he does every day is, is kickstart his day being spiritually formed by God. 
That's how important it was. It was his custom. You see, there's a lot to be said for establishing patterns of spirituality. Is there an urgency? Is there a determination in our lives when it comes to spiritual formation? You see, we have to be determined to do this. And what does this look like? Who, who lived this before it was written down? There's a guy named Daniel in, in, the, in the Old Testament. He, he, was a, he was a Jew who was captured and, and taken back to Babylon, and he was enslaved, basically, and, and made to work for the Babylonian government. And there's this passage where, and, and maybe we're all familiar with it, I'm just kind of going to go over the, 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 uh, the high points here. But we've heard the story of Daniel in the lion's den. And, and the, the idea there is that you know, Daniel gets thrown into this den of lions, and God ultimately saves him from the lions. But, but, but that's, not the, the, you know, that's not all there is to the story. There's a whole lot more that leads up to that story. And and all of it has to do with Daniel's determination to be spiritually formed by God. Because there was, you know, he was doing a job and and, and he was working with other people. And of course, they didn't like him because he was a good guy and he was uncorruptible. And and, and they couldn't, uh, you know, they couldn't find any fault in him. They wanted to take him down. So they... They convinced the king to make a rule that you couldn't pray to anyone other than the king for 30 days. And if you did, then you would be uh, uh, be killed. I I mean, what's the big deal? I got to take a break for 30 days. I mean, you know, there's worse things that can happen to me, right? Right? I mean, I can't, I, I can't pray. Well, first of all, these guys knew that, that Daniel had a habit of praying in plain view, in plain sight, every day at the same time, same place, same window, everything. He was, he was diligent. He, he was uh, um, consistent. You could count on Daniel praying every single day, and they knew that. They knew that. He, he was not thrown off of his game uh, for, for anything. And so for 30 days, you can't pray to anybody but the king. And if you don't, if you, if you pray to anybody but the king, then, then you're going you're, you're to be killed. And, and it doesn't take long to read in Daniel where, well, sure enough, there he is. Same time, you know, same bat place, same bat channel. He's, Daniel's praying like clockwork. And they say, you know, they, uh, it, you know, they realized this was his pattern of behavior. And they were counting on the fact that Daniel was so serious about being discipled and being transformed and spiritually formed by God that he did not have 30 days to spare in his spiritual life. He couldn't, he could not alter his pattern. And my question for me is, Shane, are you so determined to grow spiritually that you will do it at the risk of being burned or eaten alive? You see, in, uh, um, in verse 10 of chapter 6 in Daniel, it said, now when Daniel learned that the decree the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed. What's what's the level of determination for us when it comes to our spiritual formation? When it comes to being discipled by God? What's the level of urgency when it comes to our study or our prayer or our meditation or our our fasting or our any of the other spiritual disciplines that we have talked about at length in this very room together? What is our level of urgency and determination? Is it snatching people from the fire type urgency? 
Is it, is it getting so close to the heat, but, but not shrinking back from the pain or not shrinking from the discomfort, but doing whatever we have to do to get close enough to make an impact on those who are outside of Christ? What is the level of urgency and determination for us? You see, because Daniel's level of determination got noticed. You see, his spirituality poured over into his job. And it, and it was something that, that everyone around him realized and noticed. And it's, it got noticed by those who were around him. And so determination that, that is a, a being discipled is one that, is, that, that has no time to spare. And it's one that's going to be noticed. And, and we have a remedy for when it gets noticed. Remember that in, in 1 Peter when he says, what do we do when, when others come and ask us about why we have the hope we have? We tell them it's all about Jesus. See, that's what we're supposed to do is live a determined, urgent, discipled uh, life to where others notice it around us. And they want to find out why, why are we the way that we are. This is a passage that should not be uh, unfamiliar to any of us because I, I talk about it all the time where we live in such a way that brings attention not to us, but brings attention to the fact that we are doing something to serve that which is outside of ourselves. And other people notice it. You see, Daniel was living this Jude 22 lifestyle way before it was written down. What can we say about our urgency? You see, we are called to be disciplers. The question for each one of us is, what are we waiting for? I, I'll reach out to that person. I will, be, uh, I, I will take God up on, his, on the ministry of reconciliation. But, but just as soon as I, what? Just as soon as I finish, the, you know, I'm right in the middle of this big project and I've got to get this done. You know, it's just, it's monopolizing all of my time. You know, one of the things that I, I was convicted of yesterday, you know, because I, I think about the sermon and I'm preaching it to myself all week long and, and I'm, you know, and I've talked about my lawn and I'm super thrilled and excited and proud of my lawn and I think, what, am I willing to let my lawn just go to, go to pot so that I can talk to my neighbors about the Lord? Am I, am I willing to, you know, just as soon as I get finished, because my lawn is an ongoing thing. It's a never-ending project. It's a chore that, that has no completion, right? Because guess what? As soon as I fertilize it, it grows, and then I got to mow it, and then, you know, then I got to get the weeds out of it, and then sure enough, it's like the, uh, you know, the, the Golden Gate Bridge. As soon as I get finished mowing it, I got to start all over mowing it again. And I said, remember, if you paint the Golden Gate Bridge, as soon as you get done, you got to start over. You know, never mind. But it's just as soon as I get done with this chore, as soon as I get done with this project, as soon as I get done with this thing at work or whatever, th then I I'll... Or do we have the mentality of Daniel that I, I don't have any time to spare. Oh, there's a decree against what I'm doing. I, I can't take 30 days off. I'm sorry. See, I'm afraid. You know what I'm afraid of? That, that if, you know, the, the government did this or did that, and all of a sudden in the United States of America, there was a decree that you couldn't have church for 30 days. You know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid that I would be one of the ones that said, you know what, guys, let's just, let's just stick it out. Let's just wait it out. It's only a month. We'll, we'll see each other at the end of this. See, I'm afraid I would take the easy way out instead of being willing to be seen, being determined to grow. I'm afraid sometimes that my urgent determination can take a back seat to what's comfortable or what's culturally relevant. You know, I know God is calling me to sacrifice, but I'm not finished using X, Y, or Z. I'm not, I'm not real, really, do, I'm not done with this yet, and, but, but as soon as I do, then I'll, I'll give it to... I'll, You know, when I'm done, God can have it. See, the problem is, is that we find ourselves being oh so generous with things that we no longer want. But is our time that very same thing? That very same thing. 
you know, God, God can have the leftover time. My, my spiritual formation can take place in the, in the margins of my life. Because until we take that, snatch others from the fire, until we take that urgent determination and apply that to, to just our own spiritual formation, we will never, ever turn into reconciling disciplers. Because we'll, we'll, we'll never... We'll never be transformed to the point where we understand what God's calling us to do. And life will always consist of so much other. And that's the, that's the challenge right there, guys. I mean, I, I wish I could say it another way, but that's the challenge. For us, as, a, as you know, we say that we are restoring first century Christianity. Go back and read Acts. Read what what it looked like to be a first century Christian. Church, you know, what we're doing wasn't a part of life. It was life. It was it. They met daily. Met daily. Yeah, but they didn't have jobs like we do. They didn't have career. They 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 didn't have that. Oh, okay. Okay, sure. I don't know what I don't know what changes I have to make. The list keeps growing. But I'll tell you they're drastic. I'll tell you they're drastic. Because I am afraid that I am more willing to pray for those in the fire. And I use the air bunnies to, oh, I'll pray for them. I'm more willing to, to, my thoughts and prayers are with them, but my body's not. And I, I, I just can't escape the reality that God's calling us to be so involved in being discipled that, that we can't stand the fact that there are some who don't know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I had this whole ending, but it's a thing, and I don't have any time for it, so I'll just say this. Will we take God up on his offer to have nothing else in our life but him, to be formed by him so that we can invite others to that very thing? And the good news is, is that if we will take him up on that offer, there's no better life to be lived. There's no life, there's no more joyous, more peaceful, more purposeful. There, there's no better life to be lived. Now, I didn't bring my bulletin up here with me. What's our next song? Oh, I guess I could just do that, couldn't I? I guess I can't. Anyway, Jesus is Lord. Well, if Jesus, and and we're going to sing that song, there it is. And if, and and, and guys, let me tell you, I am the world's worst at this. I will sing this song all day long, but will I live it? Will I mean it? Will Jesus, and, and you see, Jesus isn't just our Savior. He's our Savior and Lord. That means he calls the shot. Will he do that this week? Will we have an, a determined urgency about our discipleship this week? Uh, together we stand and as we sing.